when we talk about the messy middle of work, one of the biggest questions that consistently comes up is how we can ensure that Canadian workers are equipped with the knowledge and skills that they need to navigate and thrive in the labor market of tomorrow, and frankly, the labor market of today. A major piece of that puzzle is the connection between learning institutions and the needs of the job market. Our next guests will be focused on exactly that. Harvey Weingarten is the principal of the Missioner Institute of Education at the University Hospital Network in Toronto. And he's also one of the Brave New Work Advisory Council members who's helped guide this project since the get-go. Thank you for that. Harvey's written a paper. It was released by the PPF about two weeks ago. And that paper discusses a few of the changes and adjustments that are needed in Canada's university sector in order to better equip learners and workers for the ever evolving Canadian economy. Harvey's gonna join us in just a few minutes to tell us more about his research and recommendations. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce Jaspreet Singh, a respiratory therapist who graduated from Missioner right at the beginning of the pandemic and Rosanna Tamburi, the author of three Brave New Work case studies on the value of innovation in higher education. Together, Rosanna and Jaspreet We'll explore some real life experience and on the ground context for the policy and innovation thinking that Harvey will present. Rosanna and Jaspreet, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Hi, thanks Beth. for having me. Hi, Jaspreet. Hi, Rosanna. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> yes, most definitely, you as well. So the last time we spoke for the case study, you uh, were telling me about some of the challenges and concerns that you faced as you were finishing up your undergraduate studies at Wilfrid Laurier. Can you take us back to that time and tell us what was going through your mind? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think just like any new undergrad, especially in the sciences, uh, you feel like you're very streamlined into either thinking about whether or not you're going to be doing your master's and then hopefully pursuing a PhD or thinking about, oh, is med school an option or any one of these other specialty, specialty areas. Um, so for myself, after graduating, um, I knew I wanted to do, uh, continue my work in research and I very much enjoyed working um, in a lab for about two years or so and helping pursue research and uh, getting that done. But I, I knew that there was there was something else missing. I, I wanted more of that human interaction and find my way into healthcare essentially. But I wasn't sure where I could essentially get started. Um, so it kind of left me a little bit troubled after finishing an undergraduate degree, spending four years and then spending two years in research, not knowing if I directly wanted to um, essentially pursue my master's education after that. But you felt that that wasn't enough to, to, to get a job, the undergraduate degree alone. Yeah, definitely. I, I felt like it was very competitive uh, once I had graduated. Um, it was different growing up in a household where everyone's in business and finance. Uh, everyone kind of graduates after they're getting their BBA and mastering and uh, being in finance and then just finding a job right off the bat. Uh, for myself, after graduating in sciences, I, I wasn't sure what that could lead me towards. And I felt like it was very competitive being in a saturated market. I wasn't sure what the society needed and what holes that needed to be filled precisely. So um, that's when I kind of stumbled upon Mishner and I was lucky enough to attend a, a university college fair within my university um, to kind of explore different options after graduation. Yeah, and you, so eventually you enrolled in the respiratory therapy program at Mishner. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so definitely. how did that program, what was it about it that appealed to you and how did it differ from your undergraduate work? Uh, well, there was definitely a difference. Um, I had seen Mishner and I had seen that they had multiple different programs available and some I had never even heard of <laughs> or didn't even know there was a need for in the hospital sectors and in these public health sectors. So going to Mishner and essentially enrolling into respiratory therapy, I instantly felt it was a very different atmosphere and dynamic. Uh, it was a very smaller class size, even from me coming from Wilfrid Laurier and being in sciences there, it was 
already a small group of us, but even more so at Mishner. Um, so you get more of that hands on and you feel like you're applying the theory you're learning into directly figuring out how everything kind of interconnects. So you'd learn something and then you would apply it in lab based. You'd learn something and you would apply it. So you always had to be on your feet learning and applying as you went. Um, so there was definitely that difference. I feel like in university, I did have labs, but a lot of the labs that we would do, um, I, I'm pretty sure I can speak on behalf of the other students who did go to school with me. We weren't understanding what the application or the true application to real world was for a lot of hours. It was more industrial based. So going into missionary, it was more applied and more of the human interaction based. So there was a separate um, divide in that, but you definitely see it when you went to missionary. It was, it was a wonderful education that I received over there. And then as Thas mentioned, you graduated just as the pandemic hit. In fact, you graduated a month early, right? To meet the demand for respiratory therapists. Uh, yeah, this then, is true. <laughs> and then you went to work at Toronto Western. Can you tell yep. us what that experience was like, the transition and, and, and being thrown into that kind of environment? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, pass a lot of my core uh, areas before going in um, to work, essentially, as a pandemic hit. Uh, you did see the need, a lot of the hospitals started to feel an overwhelming pressure of the number of sick patients that would come in with respiratory distress. And that was ultimately new for a lot of us. It reminded a lot of the older staff of SARS essentially when it had hit uh, Toronto at that time. Uh, so it started to kind of give people a little bit of PTSD and flashback to back then. Um, I was a student at Toronto Western and I was fortunate enough to uh, get hired within University Health Network um, and essentially hit the ground running and go straight into the ICU and start taking care of COVID patients. Uh, essentially, the first day I started um, as a result of uh, being accelerated uh, from the program. So that was a very much uh, a bit of a shock kind of, <laughs> of realizing the realness of this uh, pandemic that had onset into Toronto and Canada as a whole and worldwide, essentially. And how, how are things at the hospital these days? Oh, it's it's definitely getting better. You you see the results of these vaccines and um, and what they've done, and you've seen all the 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 terrible things that have happened, and for families to have been lo losing so many of their loved ones, and you see all these positive benefits of being vaccinated and following these rules. And I understand it's been so difficult. Uh, with these lockdowns and it feels like there's no growth or progress and and, and it's definitely had taken an emotional tone, toll on everyone but seeing this positive outcome that's now resulting in the, in the hospitals it, it makes it feel like everything was was worth worth it and as a society we've come together and we're all progressing towards uh, hopefully like a new normal but essentially just a little bit different from our baseline normal that we were previously at. Jaspreet, I want to thank you very much for sharing your story with us. It's yes. been very inspirational. Thank you so much for having me. So now I'd like to turn it over to Harvey Weingarten. Harvey? Uh, so thank you. And thank you to the Public Policy Forum for this opportunity and for the Brave New World Project, which I, I do think is addressing one of the more pressing and important issues um, that'll shape the future of Canada. So uh, as you heard uh, from Vance, I was invited and accepted the invitation to write something about how we could better align the world of universities with the world of work. Uh, let's be clear about something. Universities are not the only institutions in Canada that are involved in skills upgrading, reskilling, that are important to address lifelong learning, the gig economy, et cetera. Canada is investing, and I'm quite thankful for this, is investing quite heavily in a whole variety of programs with a whole variety of organizations that are involved in trying to make sure that our 
workforce has the appropriate skills, competencies, and talents to support the economy, to get good jobs, to keep good jobs, and to move the economy forward and keep Canada globally competitive. But the reality is that Canada makes a huge investment in the public education system, including in a public university system. And the level of investment the country is making in, for example, Canada's public university system is greater by orders of magnitude of the collective investment being made in all of these boutique and smaller programs that are involved in upskilling and upgrading. Why are they doing it? They're doing it because governments, certainly since World War II, have had the view that higher education, that universities, one of their primary functions, and one of the reasons the public is prepared to invest in them is because they educate the workforce for the jobs that are there, for the jobs that will be there in the future, to attract new jobs, uh, new companies, and better and newer jobs to the jurisdiction. I would be remiss if I didn't say that every student survey I know, that when you ask students what is the dominant reason they go to universities, not the only one, but the dominant reason students give to go to for why they're going to university is to get the education and to acquire the knowledge they need to get a good job. And so we have to, as a country, leverage this huge investment in the public university system to support, to uplift the workforce and to ensure that we have the workforce with the talent, skills, and competencies to make Canada and to keep Canada globally competitive. There is a huge amount of chatter about how well we're doing. How well are universities and university programs now preparing students for the workforce? Opinions will differ. But let me say that a lot of people are complaining. There's a lot of research out there, a lot of surveys where employers are saying that the graduates from universities today do not necessarily have the skill set that will make them competitive in the jobs and the workplaces that we have today. The public has internalized this message. It is noteworthy. There was a survey in the United States. There are a significant proportion of the United States population that believe that an internship at Google is more helpful to a student for their working career than a Harvard education. We have reams of data, reams of surveys of employers who are telling us that the skill set of graduates just isn't what they need to see. So the question is, how can we do a better job of aligning what goes on at universities with the requirements of workforce, of the workplaces? So I wrote this paper. I won't rehearse it for you here. You all can read it at your leisure and read it in whatever detail you want. And the paper itself distills some of the arguments I made in a book that's coming out in a couple of weeks on uh, the state and reform of the Canadian public university system. But let me just quickly highlight the seven policy recommendations. After all, public policy forum is a policy shop. What are the seven policy recommendations that are made in the paper to better align what goes on at universities to what goes on in workplaces? Number one, universities should increase their emphasis on the development of skills rather than the dominant influence now on the transmission of knowledge. Look, there's been a huge amount of writing on the purposes of the university. What should universities do? What should a graduate know and be able to do? And of course, we expect students to have a whole bunch of disciplinary knowledge. But we also expect students who graduate from university to be literate, numerate, good problem solvers, good communicators, critical thinkers, to be able to work in teams. The logic of most curricula now in universities is we will predominantly emphasize the transmission of information and content. And by doing that, 
students will acquire these other cognitive skills like critical thinking, communication, problem solving, as a result of what we do when we teach information, when we evaluate it, and when we credential it. The trouble is that we have a lot of research on this topic now. And while that may be true for a lot of students who go through university who do have those skills at the right level, <coughs> The reality is that the research demonstrates that there's a fair proportion. Estimates will differ, perhaps as much as 20% of students who graduate from university do not have the skill set, the problem solving skills, the teamwork skills, the communication skills that they need to not only do well in the workplace, but frankly also to just navigate the decisions they'll have to make in their life. So we need to do a better job of teaching skills. We need to do a better job of evaluating skills. And that should be rebalanced relative to the significant emphasis now on transmission of information. Second thing, second policy suggestion that universities should actually credential skills. Universities are in the credentialing business and society relies on them to validate what a student has learned and their capacities as a result of their university education. Right now, what students get is a transcript that lists the courses they took and the grades they got at them. Employers don't find this relevant, which is why big employers like Microsoft, Google, Apple, Random House, don't even want to see a university transcript anymore when they put a, an applicant through a hiring process. They want to know about skills. And if universities do a better job of teaching skills, evaluating them, they will equally have to do a better job of credentialing those skills. If they don't do it, we will see what's happening in the United States, which is the proliferation of significant numbers of private companies that will get into the credentialing business, whether those are private companies or third parties. Third policy recommendation about uni aligning universities with the workplaces. And this has as much to do with government as it does with the university themselves. There's been a lot of research looking at the relationship between what one does at university and the jobs they eventually get. It's been dominated by two questions. Number one, can we predict the jobs that will be available in the future? And number two, which fields of study, which disciplines, which programs, which majors at universities lead to which jobs? We have done innumerable number of studies on this. And we have a very clear answer to both of these questions. So the good news is we have a clear answer. The bad news is it's not the answer people expected, nor the one they necessarily wanted. Number one, can we predict which jobs will be available in the future? No. There's almost no evidence from studies done since World War II that we have been able to predict with any degree of planning utility, which jobs will be available, in what numbers, in what, at what times. We simply can't predict that. And if depending on the pundit you believe, one of the reasons for that is that 50, 60, 70% of jobs that current students will have during their working career have not even been developed yet. Just like Jerry Diaz said, there will be different kinds of jobs out there. Number two, what's the correlation between a field of study and the job you get? The answer is zero, even in the regulated professions. People from different disciplines do a whole host of jobs and this completely frustrates governments. Governments are of the view that they should fund the number of spots in a program and universities to equal the number of jobs out there. Not only do we not know what jobs are gonna be available or do, or out there, equally, we do not know which fields of study lead to which jobs. And the classic, perhaps the most important example of that 
is the silliness of our STEM policies in Canada today. Canada, like many other countries, is heavily investing in the STEM disciplines. In some countries, in some cases, governments are removing public funding from non-STEM and putting it into STEM because there is a belief that all these STEM students are gonna go into STEM jobs and really drive the economy. The trouble is that the Council of Canadian Academies that actually studied this revealed something quite important. The majority of students who graduate with a STEM degree don't go into STEM jobs. And a significant number of people in STEM jobs hold a non-STEM degree. So the answer is that we can't predict from a field of study what job you will eventually have. What does that mean? What that means is we have to worry less about whether you're graduated with a BA or a BSc or a history degree or a fine arts degree or a humanities degree. And we should worry more about the skills and competencies you have acquired during your, grad, during your university education. And what does that say about the future of jobs? Fourth, um, Canada is not the most innovative country. Jerry Diaz gives the country an F on innovation. There are people who think he's being a little kind. Our Canadian public university system is extraordinarily homogeneous. Yes, we have different universities, some big, some small, some with graduate programs, some without, some with professional programs, some with not. But the culture and tone of many of our universities and higher education institutions in Canada is remarkably the same. We need institutions in Canada. We need a greater diversity of institutions and we need them to be more innovative. We need places in Canada like Western Governors University. We need competency-based education programs in Canada. We need different institutions that other countries around the world have discovered don't look like the traditional university, but do a remarkably good job of educating students getting them the skills and competence they need and are extremely successful in terms of the labor market outcomes of those students. Next policy, if we're gonna do that, we have to get government out of the way. We need less government regulation. We need less government bureaucracy because right now, government regulation and bureaucracy is squelching innovation of even the most courageous and bold university administrator who'd like to do something different. We don't have a great history of innovation in the Canadian public university system. There are people who would do more, but as you do more, you butt up immediately against the highly regulatory world that higher education institutions live in. And if we're gonna do a better job of aligning higher education with jobs, we need a greater diversity of institutions. We need more innovative and focused universities. And there are terrific examples from around the world, some of which you can read about in the paper. But right now is extraordinarily difficult to bring them into existence because of extreme amounts and undue, I would argue, amounts of government regulation and bureaucracy. Six. We have a very accessible post-secondary higher education system in Canada. We, among many nations, have shown that we have a higher participation and attainment rate in higher education than many other OECD countries, but it's uneven. We have groups of people in our country who come from low-income, indigenous groups, certain other cultural groups, first students who come from first generation families who are underrepresented in our universities. It's regrettable because the best research we have says that if they are go to university and succeed, they will fundamentally change their expected life trajectory. And there's lots of data like that. Right now, the way we try to get underrepresented students into post-secondary into university 
is we put a lot of a lot of financial aid as a transition zone between high school graduation to attending university. And we believe that if we grew the post the university system and put a lot of money into that zone, we would close the what is called the access equity of access gap and have more underrepresented students go to university. That hasn't proven to be the case. There are many factors that determine whether someone will go to university. There are many factors that determine whether a student who otherwise might not be expected to go to university will make the decision to go. And we have some real success stories in Canada, like pathways to education. But those are fundamentally different policy decisions and funding decisions than the traditional thing we do in Canada, which is pour a huge amount of money into student aid programs for those already who've decided to go to university. We need to do a much better job of targeting those who probably are not thinking about going to university and how we can get them there. And the last recommendation I'll make, I made in the paper is this. We have to, we are trying things, good for us. We are trying to innovate, terrific. We are funding a whole bunch of programs to try to upskill and upgrade, terrific. But almost all of the money we put into this goes into operational and project funding. Very little of that money actually goes into evaluation of the, whether those programs are successful or not whether the investment we made in those programs actually leads to the successful and positive outcomes we had hoped for, which is why we invested in them in the first place. Innovation by definition means that some things will prosper and succeed, but some things will fail. Nothing wrong with that. We need some failures, but we need to know what works and what doesn't. And the only way to do that is to actually spend some of the money we fund, we put into funding to require rigorous disciplined evaluation of these programs. I think it's quite sensible that every operational funding program a government makes should reserve 5%, for example, of the funding to, a, to the requirement of a rigorous evaluation. Anyway, I've said enough. I'm a great believer in the public university system, what it has done to the country and what it can do and what we need it to do in the future. Is it doing a reasonable job? Yes. Can we do a much better job? I think equally yes. But that means <coughs> that we're gonna to have to do some things differently. Thank you. Well, here's to doing a much better job. Thank you for that overview. Harvey. Um, we're going to take your questions now. Thank you for submitting them in the chat. There's still time. And to get things started, I hope this is okay. I, I'd like to call on someone. I, I'm hoping to hear from Jake Hirsch Allen from LinkedIn. Um, Jake, if you can go ahead and unmute your microphone and tell us what you're thinking, uh, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Thanks, Vass. And Harvey, great to hear from you. Great to hear from you as well, Vass, Rosanna, and Jaspreet. Um, I'll be relatively brief. I was brief. I was very, very excited uh, to hear much of what Harvey was promoting. I agree with sort of my shortened, shortened version of, of your presentation and paper, which basically says Canadian post-secondaries need to prepare students better for their futures and particularly the soft skills they and their employers are demanding. Um, in particular, I was also excited about your rigorous evaluation, uh, sort of your, your demand for rigorous evaluation, because right now, I think, as you pointed out, there's often almost none. And uh, I think that the question that I am getting to relates to a broader question, not just of whether universities are preparing students for their futures, but rather, are they preparing themselves for the future? For instance, if, as I think, the global future of education will be split between affordable, asynchronous online education, think edX, Coursera, or my primary employer, and expensive, elitist, in-person education, think executive education in Canada, will Canadian post-secondaries be able to adapt to this new reality? So, Jake, always good 
to hear from you. Number one, we don't want some universities to adapt. We have certain universities in Canada that are our ways of competing in the higher education space globally. And some of them are doing spectacularly well and we need them to continue to, to do that. That said, there is, a, there, should, there is and should be a revolution going on in education. And we don't talk about it in Canada. My God, look at the Globe and Mail, the, the full page ads that universities put out. It's all about some research program. And someone was appointed to the, to the Royal Society and some researcher doing this, all of which is terrific. Universities do have a research mandate, but we have no almost serious, comprehensive, deep discussion of curriculum and the educational mission of universities. I'm gonna speak about Jaspreet for a minute. Sorry. I, 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 Yes, I'm at Mitch. I spent my whole life in big research universities, and now I'm at Michener. And I'm at Michener for the same reason Jaspreet was at Michener, because there is a tone to the curriculum there. Jaspreet didn't only learn how to be a respiratory therapist. Her profession is going to change over the next five years. But because of the nature of the education she got and the preparation she got, she also acquired a set of skills and competencies. She will move with the profession. In fact, may I dare predict, she will be a leader of the change in her profession. We're not paying enough attention to that. So Jake, yes, more education will be asynchronous. The big trends in higher education now is personalized curricula. You don't go into lockstep with everyone for four years the way we used to. We personalize a curriculum for you. We worry about skills and competencies and credentialing those. And do we see some of that going on around the world? Absolutely. Do we see some of that going on in Canada? Regrettably, almost none. And so, you know, I don't think they're preparing themselves very well. And it's not gonna serve it. And we could do a better job doing that. Let's keep doing a better job. Jake, thanks so much for that question. And I was a little bit remiss. Welcome back, Rosanna and Jaspreet. I'm glad you're back on the digital stage with us. We'll be tossing questions your way too. And feel free to signal to me or just unmute yourself if you want to jump in. Um, there's another audience member I'm going to turn to for their question. And that's Shamira Madhani from World Education Services. Shamira, do you mind unmuting yourself and sharing your question with us? Absolutely. Um, hi, Harvey, Dr. Wayne Garden. Um, it's been a little while. Um, you know, so it's, it's a comprehensive paper, you know, I took time reading it and you have some great policy recommendations, so very clear. And if one were to read the full paper, you would go, yeah, common sense, what's taking the post-secondary sector so long to make the changes? And why isn't government mandating the post-secondary sector to do this? Um, however, I think that when I really think about all the issues that you even put on the table, the reality is that there's so many different organizations that play a role. Government with respect to uh, legislation, funding, consistency with respect to the outcomes that each student gets, employers with respect to hiring, um, higher education individuals. And even with respect to individuals, Dr. Weingarten, you talked about those that can self-navigate, those that are first generation, those that are kids of, of newcomers. So I think that the, the situation isn't as simple as let universities or higher education step up to the plate. I think employers have an equal responsibility. They shouldn't just assume that somebody will, you know, get a micro credential or what Google says, great, I'll have somebody who's ready because it's all about competition for them. But are we going to miss the foundational skills that one gets from an academic perspective and then moving into the workplace. So it's a question that I have for you. Government started the work integrated learning for a reason. We have the academic foundational pieces and then employers have to also step up to the plate and not have people already made and they'll say, here's what I want and institutions have to then deliver. It's a partnership, I think, between government, employers, 
higher education individuals play a role. So I just would like to, to get some comments from you regarding um, you know, a slightly longer commentary than normal. Sure, thank you. Thank you for your question and those reflections. I will turn it to you, Harvey, in a second. Let me also just flip that script a little bit and ask, are these novel work integrated learning partnerships just kind of the new unpaid internship where students are paying for an academic credit to earn them uh, work experience that's certainly valuable, but creates a huge advantage for students who are in post-secondary. Uh, and in that conversation about the experience premium, we're totally leaving behind people that don't go to a post-secondary or aren't in a post-secondary context. So I'm being a bit of a wild card and hijacking our own, very own panel. Um, but Harvey, did you want to share reflections on work integrated learning or maybe just Preet, anything related to the training you've been exposed to that might be relevant here? Yes, and thank you for, for, for both sets of questions. They're spot on. Of course, the world of higher education is complicated. And if we're going to get it right, we're going to need to do what Jerry Diaz said. We're going to get the, we need to get the right people in a room and have a serious deep conversation about what's going on here. And right now, we appear not to have the capacity to do that. We're lobbing shells across the bow. Not very helpful. But let me make a number of quick comments on, on, on the question that was asked. Um, again, I don't want to rehearse it here, and, 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 and I'm not trying to sell books. No one gets rich in Canada writing a book about universities. Um, but there's a whole chapter to why are Canadian universities so slow to innovate, and it'll go some way to answering your question of that, number one. Number two, I'm going to defend employers. I think some of the most eloquent defenders of what a higher education looks like nowadays are the CEOs of companies, as we've seen in the Public Policy Forum and TD and others. They're the ones talking about generic skills. They're the ones talking about critical thinking, problem solving, communication, teamwork, all those things that universities for years just assumed their students were acquiring, employers saying they're not, and that's what they're asking for. There has never been a time in my experience of a greater convergence between what employers are asking universities to do and what universities say they are doing. Trouble is right now, we have a very different view as to whether we're getting the job done or not. So could employers do more? Should they get, do more? Should they invest more in training in Canada? Of course they should. But I actually think employers are doing, are a strong voice for the kind of reform of the higher education system we need. Work integrated learning, why do we have it? We have it because there's a belief out there that all of those skills that you can't learn in a 200 seat lecture hall, you will learn if you do a co-op or a work integrated learning experience. And so you have, oh my God, you have a proliferation of co-ops, work integrated learning. You have huge amounts of money from the Business Higher Education Council, from governments, provincial government, federal governments, going into promoting work integrated learning. Fantastic. There's only one thing missing. Some of those experiences lead to the outcomes we want and some, will, some do not. That's the argument for evaluation. Let's figure out how you invest in something like that that works. Look, I, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it here, but in Canada, for better or for worse, you can't make change in a public sector without the engagement of government, mm -hmm. or at least government get out of, getting out of, out of the way. And so a productive conversation between universities and government is something we need. We don't have it now. And if we don't get there, I don't, I'm not very optimistic about things changing. Harvey, we want to, we want to catalyze that change and, and get some shared optimism. I'm also happy to have people push back on Harvey's comments around the, the lack of innovation on campus, you know, more, you know, I, I think we can get some interesting tension there in conversation. Jaspreet, I wonder if you wanted to briefly comment, um, you've had work integrated learning, uh, direct experience with work integrated learning, and maybe you can contrast that with uh, the types of learning experiences you had in your lab during undergrad, and then the direct connection between the postgrad program and employers, if that's okay. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I would kind of add to, I agree uh, a little bit about what Harvey did mention earlier. I do feel like a lot of the responsibility uh, may lay in university education, just because um, going through your undergrad, a lot of the times uh, you are working towards a common goal, uh, but you, you do have to still kind of create and learn how to uh, build these skills such as teamwork and problem solving. They may just feel a little bit more, um, <laughs> you're working toward, everybody's working towards the same goal and everyone's more so interested in, okay, well, if my partner doesn't work out, I'm just going to be kind of tunnel vision and I'm gonna get it done. So a lot of us, I feel like in university, we're more focused uh, less on the skills because we get the theory and we think we're getting the credentials we need and we, we will complete whatever task we need to to essentially get to the end result, which is a degree at the end. Um, I think that it also comes with work ethic. A lot, a lot of us come from different backgrounds and um, myself coming from a family of immigrants, um, I was expected to carry out a part-time job uh, while I was in school. So I, I and I have a background in sports. So a lot of it was from basketball and soccer. I, I learned early on how to develop these teamwork and uh, team working skills, problem solving, and like team cohesion is such a big factor. And I feel like a lot of us who've had that exposure and have ingrained that work ethic, um, it's allowed us to overcome some of these um, issues that a lot of us are saying that, oh, employers, are not um, necessarily hiring because they're looking for a specific X, Y, Z uh, mm -hmm. just on a piece of paper. Um, a lot of us are going in and we're trying to, trying our best to be above that and saying, well, you know, I'll try my best. I'm a hardworking individual and I have this, this, this as my background. I feel like a lot of students who I went to school with, they also may have just not had the opportunities to do certain things such as myself. Um, but I feel like that's what kind of sets you apart when you go out to employer because marks can only take you so far um, in school. And as soon as you graduate, right. you're, it's up to you to kind of take that ultimate step to prove yourself at the end of the day. Of course. I mean, I, I'm glad you mentioned other ways you can acquire those skills or narrate those skills in terms of telling telling your own your your story and also a great reminder that many of the skills that employers uh, claim they want, those top skills that Harvey pointed to, uh, critical thinking, creativity, communication, which are the same skills CEOs have been reporting for years when, when surveyed, just as they've been consistently reporting over time that new graduates simply don't have the skills that they want. Those skills are difficult to credential for, right? It's Definitely. Hard. And let's and Harvey shaking his head no. So let's talk about that because I want to talk a little bit more in the limited time we have about what that innovation on campus really looks like. We know it's more than just going online. We know it's more than part-time options. We know it's more time than a little bit of flexibility. Um, and we had a, a quick example or question come up through the chat. Um, there's a class called How Basketball Can Save the World at NYU with a gentleman called David Hollander. It teaches core skills. Is that innovation kind of fit into the traditional model of post-secondary? Should we pilot that kind of approach here in terms of maybe some of the diversity of courses that people take, whether or not we're personalizing their curriculum. I open that to you and Harvey, if you wanna directly respond to, I, just because you were shaking your head, it seemed energetic, <laughs> like it'd be a great response. And Rosanna, I promise I'm gonna get to you. Otherwise, I'm never gonna be invited back. I'll be the worst moderator. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if I could just quickly speak on it uh, before Harvey gets the chance. Um, I, I feel like a lot of the times, uh, just growing up, you have, certain individuals you're with and they believe they don't have the athletic ability to get involved in sports and it intimidates them um but i feel like a lot of us we need to look past that and it's funny that you mentioned that course because i feel like once you get kind of get in that team setting regardless of skill level just kind of like how it was in gym class when we were in grade in grade 9 10 in high school no matter what the skill level is it kind of forces everybody to go out of their comfort zone and 
use everybody's skills and see how you can work together as a team and overcome those obstacles. Uh, overcoming that obstacle is essentially winning against the other team. But working together, knowing that not everybody is going to be strong at doing layups or strong at being able to dribble the ball, but being a team and working together and developing those skills and not just giving up, I feel like that's a, an amazing course that they have to offer. And mm -hmm. I would encourage everybody if they, no matter what your skill level, as long as it's getting you involved and learning how to overcome and problem solve, those are some amazing credentials to even just develop and grow sure. from. Informal experiences with grit, uh, teamwork, uh, vulnerability, building skills are absolutely important, but again, not necessarily something we can directly credential, but I appreciate you exactly. sharing that. Harvey, let me throw it to you and Rosanna. I promise I'll get there. I'm so sorry again. It's not uncommon when this discussion starts for someone to make exactly the comment you've made. Can we credential these skills? Problem solving, literacy, numeracy, uh, critical thinking. The answer is absolutely. We have, we have tests of these things. The OECD makes a living credentialing and measuring literacy and numeracy. We have tests that are psychometrically rigorous that measure critical thinking. If you look at the essential skills framework that ESDC has in the federal government as part of the essential skills framework, they have a huge inventory of tests that are used to measure the kind of skills we're talking about. Now, so how some, important are tests? How important are the tests? How much do they cost? Who pays for them? Oh, please. We spend, that's all we do at universities. We take our poor students and all we do is examine the hell out of them. And we, who's, paying, who's paying for that? It's part of your university education. And all I'm saying is in the same way that we assess information, how mm -hmm. much information have you managed to drill into someone's head and you don't really care if they forget 48 hours later? How many skills have we actually fostered? To what degree in our students? And those are measurable. Should you insist on psychometrically rigorous tests? Absolutely. Do we have psychometrically rigorous tests for all of the skills we would like to measure? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And we should, that's a, it's an important area of research. But all we right. do have ways of measuring these things. They can be credentialed and they are as valid as all the other measurements we do at university. Yeah, yeah, Harvey, I'm not saying they're invalid. I'm just suggesting that sometimes with our narrative of lifelong learning, my own concern is that it's a certain segment of the population that has to continually pay out of pocket to demonstrate that they are creative or they have critical thinking skills. It's it's an aspect that hasn't quite come through in our discussion yet. And I know- we Yeah, have fair enough. It. Yeah. That's, that's all. An MPP program that I run has skills labs and skills built into it at a university campus. So I'm, I'm very supportive of skills in, in post-secondary mm -hmm. and I do know how difficult it is to do new things on campus or at least try to. <laughs> Rosanna, what is, you know, what does innovation mean to you? What's been on your mind? You're you're so generous. You haven't cut any of us off, though I would have accepted you doing that at any moment in time. I think uh, well, speaking from a personal experience, and I don't think it's that uncommon. Um, you know, after I took myself out of the labor market, the paid labor market after I had children. And I, you know, I think that a lot of people do that. And then you're looking to go back with five years later or however many years later. And I think you're confronted with the same kinds of feelings that Jasper Reed had, you know, like you may have lost your labor market contacts. You may feel that your skills aren't what they used to be. Um, you don't necessarily want to go back and do another diploma or another degree program. So what, uh, what, is, the, what is out there? You know, I know that there are some programs, but I think that it would be very helpful to have you know something in a systematic way that can that can help uh, not just parents looking to re-enter the, the workforce, but you know people who have for whatever reason maybe they've lost their jobs, maybe there's been a pandemic. You know, like for for those kinds of people, that's what I'd like to see is more of that. That to me, that's what innovation would be. I love that you brought that up. Less traditional pathways. You know, it's not just what people are studying, but also the when has really changed. And when we look at over time and disrupting that higher education model, I think the when and the timing is very much so part of it. Um, 
I'm sad because I'm afraid we have to wrap it up there. And I'm really enjoying this panel. And uh, Harvey, back in my day, I was a, a research associate at uh, the COU for books many years ago. I think it was Ian Clark. So that's my shout out to that past research uh, situation. I want to thank Harvey, Rosanna, and Jess Reed for sharing their stories and insights with us today. It was fantastic. And this now brings us to the end of day one. The Public Policy Forum thanks all, all of our speakers, all of our audience members, our project sponsors, uh, and everyone who's on this digital line or watching later on, if you, you had to miss parts of this, for attending and participating today. I hope you'll join us tomorrow uh, for day two. We're going to dive deep into three more important challenges facing policymakers and decision makers in the future of work. Uh, tomorrow's programming is going to start at the same bat time, 1 p.m. Eastern, right here on Zoom, and we're going to hear from the rest of our Brave New Work authors. Uh, let me just give you an overview of who those people are. Lori Turn Turnbull is going to share uh, learning from industries that have survived disruption and transformation in the past. We'll hear from Laura Lamb on why and how we can make non-standard work a little less precarious, and from Peter Lowen on what Canadians are thinking about the rise of automation and AI in their workplaces. It's going to be another great day, and I hope to see you there. As we mentioned in the beginning, we're keen to hear from you. What do you think are the most important policy considerations for protecting and empowering the messy middle through the future of work? I invite you to have your say by participating in our Thought Exchange Forum. Here's that link again coming at you in the chat. Um, and that's it. That's a wrap on day one of the Public Policy Forum's third annual Brave New Work Conference. The messy middle just got messier. Thank you so much for joining us. See you tomorrow. Merci tout le monde. À demain.